Okay, everyone, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the mini course of the workshops on non-normal polyam processes in finance. Happy to see you as such a distinguished audience and speakers. And uh, Christian Bayer, who's going to begin today, is a mathematician, friend of mine for a long time, and long time collaborator too, who is currently a senior scientist at the Bayer School Institute in Applied Mathematics and, and, and Stochastics in Berlin. And uh, of course, his research goes very deeply in financial mathematics and stochastic domains. And uh, you know, he has worked on major research projects in finance. And Eduardo, who is sitting, I think, will continue and share the the, the load with the uh, Christian is an assistant professor, right? At the Polytechnique in applied mathematics, and he is part of the mathematical finance group in Simba. Right? So, again, another well versed person in, in mathematical finance and stochastic calculus, stochastic Volterra equations, and uh, their application. If you learn it, it's something that you are interested in, and we all want to learn from both of you. Thank you for, so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind words and for the invitation to come here and for setting up such a wonderful workshop once again. Uh, yes, so um, the background of this mini course is that, uh, you know, last uh, year uh, uh, I was part of a mini course as well where we started uh, to uh, which was centered on machine learning methods for finance, but in particular signature methods. And one of the one of the so for for those who participated last year and also remember something, one of the uh, motivation for using signatures is that it allows you to treat uh, uh, processes, for instance, optimal control, when uh, you have processes which are non-Markov processes, so which depend on the memory. And uh, so, of course, the question arises, why do we care? Why do we need processes which uh, are not Markov processes? And in particular, why do we need it in finance? And uh, this uh, mini course here wants a little bit to motivate this question and also to show some more techniques how we can deal with processes which lack the Markov property. So, yeah, the general plan is, by the way, that I will start. At some point, Eduardo will take over, probably tomorrow. And then uh, at a very late stage, I will also kick, again take over. And also, we have prepared a few homework uh, 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 Jupyter notebooks that you're invited to work a little bit on if you want. But uh, I guess we will come that at a later stage. So at first, um, very, very briefly, what is the Markov property? Well, Markov property means that the future is independent of the past given the present. Okay, so in other words, if I have, uh, if I have uh, uh, some event A, I want to uh, understand the probability that in the future, the process takes values in, in A. And I know the whole history of the past uh, before time t, that's the same as if I only knew what happens at time t. Okay, that's the Markov process and most processes that you can think of that you encounter, let's say when you take courses on stochastic analysis, on stochastic modeling, uh, are Markov processes. So this includes in particular, uh, maybe two, famous, two favorite processes, the Poisson process and the Brownian motion, which are like the main building blocks of this machinery, at least in continuous time. And I will mostly focus on continuous time, I have to say, but also uh, later processes, 
diffusion processes, that is solutions of stochastic differential equations are Markov processes. If you go more in the jump direction, stochastic reaction networks are Markov processes. And of course, Markov chains are Markov processes. So lots of uh, 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 standard processes, but this is also true for some, you might say, not so standard processes. So for instance, if you solve stochastic partial differential equations, so you solve processes in infinite space dimension, still most likely it's going to be a Markov process. Nonetheless, so, okay. And of course, this is no coincidence because the Markov property is really crucial for a lot of analytical and in particular numerical techniques. So by and large, if your process is not a Markov process, then, well, at least at first glance, you are in real problem. You have real problems because most of the techniques you are used to will not work anymore, in at least not in a practical sense, right? Uh, so what does it mean most? most uh, 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 or many techniques will not work. So for instance, in finance, we know that we have, a, we have, a, we have set up a process, we want to price an option, then we know uh, uh, there is a pricing PDE. But that is the case if the process is a Markov process. If the process is not the Markov process, then no, <laughs> no pricing PDE. Uh, similar, if you do uh, uh, stochastic optimal control, you are used to uh, having controls in feedback form. Basically, it means that in order to uh, make a decision, you only need to know the current state of the system. If your process is not a Markov process, this is not true. I mean, you need the whole past of the system. So somehow intuitively, what this means is that if you're dealing with processes which lack the Markov property, you're always dealing with infinite dimensional processes because you always have kind of the whole past of the process as part of your state somehow. <clears throat> okay, now how can memory uh, uh, affect the dynamics of the system? I thought a bit about this and I came up with three examples which are quite prominent. And if you think a little bit about them, you will realize that these examples are not independent from each other. There's lots of uh, uh, you know, overlay between those classes, but still I think somehow that if you look at the literature, they are almost treated like separate cases. So the first one is the hidden Markov process. So what's happening here is that basically you have in the background a Markov process, but you don't observe all the components of this Markov process. And generally speaking, if you have a, let's say two dimensional Markov process, but you only see the first component, there is no reason why the first component should be a Markov process it's in its own right, right? So basically what you see is not a Markov process, but you understand that behind it, there is actually a Markov process. So an example, which we are going to see later in finance is uh, so-called stochastic volatility models, right? So you have the price process S, which depends on a stochastic instantaneous variance process V, which also has some kind of dynamics. And of course, if you only observe the price process, which is, the only thing that you can actually observe in a financial market, I mean, the volatility process is a kind of abstract concept, then under this specification, this is a hidden Markov model. But this is something, uh, hidden Markov processes are very, very common in, in engineering and all kinds of sciences, I would say. The second one, which is also very classical, uh, concept are uh, delay equations. Okay. I guess uh, you know delay equations. So basically what this means is that uh, the dynamics of the process explicitly depends 
on the past, usually on, you know, past on some kind of uh, sliding window of time. Something like moving average processes, for instance. The delay equation, but that also means that uh, uh, to make it a Markov process, you basically have to add this sliding window of time to your state. Right? I mean, very often, for instance, in delay equation, you know, the, the, of course, the dynamics depends in a very specific way on this. So there might be a chance that you can find finitely many factors which actually characterize this. But still, in general, you would need an infinite dimension. And finally, and this is going to be the main focus of uh, this mini course, it's also very often used is you see this kind of linear dependence uh, uh, modeled by something which you might call a memory kernel. So you have the dynamics, and of course, instead of being linear in X, you could also, you know, apply some function uh, alpha of X. But uh, in any case, that you have this kind of uh, 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 dependence on the past. And in particular, important is when the memory kernel K only depends on the distance to the past event. And this is then known as a Volterra equation or a stochastic Volterra equation if the whole system is stochastic. And a quote that I like very much that I found when reviewing the literature a little bit is that, you know, models with memory are the rule, not the exception. In other words, if you take uh, your, your, your task is to model a certain phenomenon occurring in nature or in society or wherever, and, you know, somehow, you shouldn't have to justify the use of a uh, of a model which is non-Markovian. You should justify the assumption that the phenomenon behind is actually Markovian. Okay. So, in this course, what we are going to talk about uh, are basically we start out with well. We essentially start out with two, let's say, fundamental building blocks or prototypical examples of non-Markov processes, which are, yeah, uh, sorry, which are in some sense uh, uh, the simplest examples, which still have a very rich structure behind them. And the one is, uh, the first one, uh, hoax processes, um, which are, in some sense, I would say, a natural non-Markovian uh, analog to uh, Poisson processes. The second one is fractional Brownian motion, which is somehow the next step in the non-Markov direction when you start from Brownian motion. I will also spend uh, uh, maybe an hour later this day to motivate a particular use of non-Markov processes in finance, namely in rough volatility. And then finally, we will talk more about stochastic Volterra processes. So processes of this type, I mean, I showed you already with this kind of memory kernel. And uh, Eduardo will teach us more about the properties and also how you can handle them. Uh, and sometimes with the, surprising uh, ease actually, <laughs> but of course, it, usually they are very difficult to handle. <laughs> Nonetheless, there's some very elegant structural properties that uh, in specific situations can occur. Okay, and generally speaking, please interrupt me at any time and ask questions, make comments, and you know, we try to make this interactive. For my uh, curiosity, who in this uh, uh, audience knows what the Hawks process is? <laughs> and who knows what the fractional Brownian motion is? That's more. Okay, good. <laughs> 
I'm happy to hear this because otherwise I would have had to say, okay, you know already what the hoax process is. I have nothing to tell you today. <laughs> Uh, more time for discussions, okay. But uh, uh, yeah. So let's go right into it. What's the Hox process? Well, before we come to Hox process, this question, I have to build up suspense a little bit. So uh, I will talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the background. Um, okay. What we're interested in are point processes, which have self-exciting behavior. So in other words, what, does self, what do I mean by self-exciting? Take the first example, which is actually the example for which Hox processes were uh, introduced, um, earthquakes. And you may know, I mean, I'm not an expert, uh, but you may know that uh, earthquakes generally are uh, followed by a lot of, I mean, earthquakes are really a sequence of events. It's not one event, but there is there may be one main shock followed by aftershocks, maybe even preceded by foreshocks. And uh, the point is, if an earthquake happens, it triggers more events coming. And this is basically, this is what I mean by self-exciting. An event happens and that event makes it more likely for other events to happen in short, uh, within a short time span. Uh, the same is true, for instance, if you think about infectious diseases, maybe we don't want to talk about this anymore, but uh, of course, again, you have an infection that uh, uh, increases the likelihood of people around you to also get infected. But there's many, many uh, social phenomena which uh, are seen to have this structure. So for instance, crime, terror attacks, traffic accidents, all of them seem to have this structure. And of course you can easily think of reasons why this might be the case. Uh, and in particular in finance, <clears throat> there is a lot of uh, uh, self-excitation to be observed. And before I go through the list, let me give a very let me give you one example. Uh, maybe I can try out the other <laughs> the fancy stuff. Okay. If you are trading in a financial market, let's say a stock exchange, then there is generally speaking two types of orders you can place. There are market orders, which basically says, I want to buy 100 shares right now at the best possible price that I can that you can give me, but I accept any price. And there are limit orders. Limit orders are orders where you say, okay, I want to sell or I want to buy 100 shares at this specific price. And they are not fulfilled immediately. They are put into a database and they're waiting to be fulfilled at some point. And there are lots of rules about this, how this happens. So for instance, there's a rule about uh, uh, which limit orders have priority. I mean, the most fair one, I guess, would be the first in has priority, but sometimes if you're a very good customer, you will get priority even though you're not the first in. And for instance, you can also cancel limit orders. So if you have placed a limit order and you don't like the price anymore, you can say, I cancel it. And you can hide limit orders. So there could be some which are visible and some which are hidden. But we are not going to talk about this kind of uh, 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 features too much. Bottom line is there is a database, it's often called the limit order book. And in this database, you, uh, place orders at certain sizes and this is often visually represented somehow like this. So you have maybe uh, sell orders at one side, buy orders on another side, 
And since they are kind of the opposite of each other, they are often represented by one going up and the other going down. And you can imagine what happens if you put in now a large market order. Large market market order will mean you will wipe out large parts of the limit order book. And that will mean you get a very bad price. So what do you do if you have a large order? So somebody, your boss tells you, you have two hours to liquidate this position and it's rather big. What you do is you split it, exactly. You split it. Because what you hope is, so let's start again. What you hope is, and what you actually see in the markets is, okay, you've placed your first order. It will eat something. Okay, let's say it eats this. Yeah. I'm lacking fine control here. And then what happens is the limit order book will be refilled. Market makers are going to see there is an opportunity here. They refill. And maybe it looks again something like this. And then you place your next small order and so on. So basically what you see is uh, so-called meta orders. So orders which are well, technically separate orders, but they belong together. And you already see self-excitation because when you see one small order being placed, there is a certain likelihood that this is actually part of a large meta order, which means that the uh, intensity of, of other orders being placed is higher. But the story doesn't stop here because there are other people, high frequency trader, who try to detect that you are placing a meta order here. They're trying to detect this and once they detect it, they're being basically trying to push the price in the direction which is unfavorable to you by placing orders. So not only are you yourself getting excited or more likely in this case, it's the opposite. I mean, you know, but uh, from an outside perspective, there's an self excitation but it's even more because your uh, orders actually excite other people to also play orders, place orders. So this is one fundamental, very important example. Um, okay. It's not sticking, never mind. One fundamental example how uh, self excitation happens in financial markets. But as you see, there's many more. Uh, I mean, by the way, in this case, you would probably want to use a two dimensional, a two dimensional process for like, for, because, or, or a market process to distinguish between, you know, uh, buy and sell orders. There is uh, 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 other uh, models that you can more actually model stock prices at very fine time scales by this. So you know we are used to using uh, continuous time, continuous space models for stock prices, but of course this does not reflect reality. In reality, price movements because they are triggered by trades can only happen on discrete times, and also. Uh, the way that exchanges works work, there's only discrete levels at which a price can occur, a trade can occur. There are ticks, right? So it's not continuous in space either. So if you want a very fine model, you probably need a discrete model. And you could use uh, this kind of uh, point processes as, as the basis for these models. 
uh, you can use it for market impact. So that was basically the story I was trying to tell you. So for instance, if you want to solve an optimal execution problem, uh, you can uh, try to model uh, things like systemic risk. So you know, one bank going bankrupt might trigger other banks to go bankrupt, or maybe the same un underlying event triggers all of these banks to go bankrupt. But you know, from a from uh, from an outside point of view, it looks like the one event triggers many others. In fact, it could actually be the one event because you know there's trade relations or there's credit relations between banks. So actually, uh, it could actually be like this as well. Arrival of news, sure. And actually, these kind of processes nowadays become something like I would say a backbone to a lot of what is called econophysics. So people trying to understand. Uh, the mechanisms or describe the mechanism at the very fine scale of financial markets. And people are asking questions uh, like, for instance, endogeneity of stock markets. So the question is basically in a, you know, in a kind of naive view, an, an asset price and also a trade in an asset price reflects the expected uh, profits or the expected cash flows or expected dividends of the company from the future of course with a discount factor discounted for today and trades are triggered in this kind of naive view trades are triggered by uh, diversity of opinions on those future profits future yields of future dividend yields of the company but as we have seen, there's also a level of endogenous traits where you don't care about or you don't have an opinion about uh, the value of the company, but you try to react to, for instance, a big order being placed and taking advantage of this high frequency trading. Uh, and uh, one of the questions that people are interested in is, at what level is so this would be an endogenous trade because it doesn't depend it only depends on things that happen in the financial market itself it doesn't depend on you know the company on the outside economic relations and uh questions are for instance how much of trading is endogenous and how much is exogenous and if you ask uh, um, People like uh, Jean-Philippe Bouchot or the econophysics community, they will tell you that trades are almost entirely endogenous. You can probably, I mean, the, the exact number that they will give you might vary, but uh, it's certainly north of 90%. So, okay. But this is. I mean, I know that this, this whole mini course comes under the umbrella term of finance, but actually, if you want to see this kind of effect, it's hard to observe because you are kind of, uh, you are drowning in data. <laughs> you have all these millions of trades going on, and there may be some, there may be thousands of meta orders, <laughs> and it's very hard to see, you know, to see these structures emerging, even though it's undoubtedly there and it's very important for this work. So instead, I will more focus on, well, the actual first motivation for these processes, and that is uh, earthquakes. And I found a very, very nice paper, famous paper from Ogata, 1988, where this is all very well explained and where he also goes a, a lot in the the modeling and also the statistics for Fox processes. And the example that he treats here are earthquakes, large earthquakes of the Tohoku area. We may remember Tohoku because about 10 years ago, there was a huge earthquake appearing in this area. But you see, this paper here was written well before that. 
And this area was known well before that as a like hotspot for seismic activity. Uh, yeah, and uh, large, I think, means if I remember correctly, magnitude greater than six. And yes, this uh, amazing time series from 1885 to 1980. And this is basically what you observe. So the number of shocks is here. And the second curve here is the cumulative square root of energy. And you can certainly identify some region where something happens, which is, you know, where, where a lot of activity happens, which may be explained by this self excitation. And as I said, foreshocks often appear before major earthquakes. Aftershocks often appear after major earthquakes. But in fact, it doesn't even have to be the case uh, that, as I learned from, from reading this, that there is like one single main shock. It could also be that you have uh, many shocks which are like of similar magnitudes. Um, there are certain classical observations people made already a long time ago. You see, for instance, frequency of aftershocks are often modeled by a power law, which is the so-called modified Omori formula. So the Omori formula, if you remember correctly, would be P equals one. And you can see it's from 1894. So this is very classical uh, 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 stuff. And another thing that is important here is the magnitude of aftershocks. And they have an exponential distribution. But one should keep in mind that the magnitude here is already on an exponential scale. So actually, this is more like a Pareto distribution if you look at the energy itself. Um, right. And we will come back to this situation later on. But let's step back one, one step and look at a more basic situation. Let's look at the counting process. So the counting process here is the right continuous process with piecewise constant uh, uh, trajectories. Uh, we start at zero. And I already imposed the restriction that the step size can only be one. We denote FT as usual, the associated filtration, and TK, the point process of, of jump times. And you may remember what the intensity is. It's basically you take the expectation of uh, uh, increments of my accounting process. And you basically take the derivative, so, so you divide by h, let h go to zero. But now, since in general we're going to work with uh, processes with memory, it's very important to take a conditional expectation here. So we condition on all the information from the past. Yeah, and this is what we denote by lambda t here. And you all know this example some process. So when the increments are independent and have a Poisson distribution for a constant deterministic intensity lambda, then this is a Poisson process. And another way to look at it from starting from an intensity would be the probability of having a jump of size one is lambda times the time step plus higher order terms. And the probability to have uh, an increment of size larger than one is actually little o of h. So that would be uh, another way to look at it. And you can imagine where the story is going to be, because later on, if you replace here the probability by a conditional probability, and you use the same formula, then you can arrive at the much 
more general class of processes. In particular, if lambda is actually time dependent, but still deterministic, we obtain what is known as a time inhomogeneous Poisson process. Shares a lot of the properties. And this is how a Poisson process looks like. <laughs> I mean, uh, so you will, I will ask you to plot something like this as part of the homework sheet, like warming up. But since we will see a lot of pictures like this, maybe let me take one minute to walk you through. So I've plotted two things here. On uh, uh, the egg, on the uh, x-axis, I have plot this cross, which are the jump times of the process. And then the line here is the counting process NT itself. Now, of course, you realize that when a jump when a jump time happens, the process jumps. That's why we call it jump time, right? Um, the intensity 10.94 sounds awfully specific. But you will see in a minute why I chose this number. I chose it because I first started to choose a particular intensity for a time inhomogeneous process, a possible process, which is like a cosine function. And then I picked the constant intensity to have the same integrated intensity over the interval of time. Right? So I was being lazy. I thought it's easier to adjust the uh, homogeneous process rather than try to fiddle around with the intensity function here. Okay, so here you see the time inhomogeneous case in red with an axis on the uh, right-hand side, you see the intensity and you see the intensity is very small here and it's large in the beginning and in the end. And of course, this is deflected by the jump times. I mean, all of this is random, so you could see potentially a jump time happen somewhere where the intensity is very small, but of course the probability is rather this small for this to happen. And you can immediately see that this kind of processes are actually very important because when we model real life events, there's often a seasonality. I mean, for instance, something that is on my mind right now, electricity prices have very strong seasonality components. And if you get the seasonality wrong, all the fancy stochastic model you do on top of it uh, will be useless because you got the most important component wrong. Okay. Now, self excitation means that the intensity does depend on the past. So now we come into processes where the intensity itself is a stochastic process. And specifically, a Hox process is a counting process with an intensity satisfying this equation here in red. So you have a baseline intensity mu, you have a memory kernel phi, and then you integrate over the past events. So what does this mean? Let's start with the right-hand side. So this is really, this integral is really a sum over all the jump times. And you see, usually phi will be decreasing, which means the longer you go, the jump happens, the less important it will be. So you forget over time. And then I have added the middle term here in order to establish a convention. And the convention is whenever I write an integral like zero to t, I always mean uh, the left open interval because these are jump processes, so it matters if you include or ex exclude the boundaries. And we include the upper boundary and we exclude the lower boundary. That's just a convention. So what requirements do we have for these guys? Well, the baseline intensity has to be positive. The memory kernel has to be positive or non-negative. And the memory kernel has to be integrable. In fact, we will, but I will come back to this, we will need more on the memory kernel. But a short discussion, what happens if mu were equal to zero? Now you see, 
the memory part only starts kicking in when the first jump has happened. Before that, it gives you nothing. So if mu is zero, no jump happens at any time. So, you know, it's a pretty boring counting process. Uh, what happens if pi is zero? Well, if pi is zero, then you have a standard Poisson process. So, you know, maybe, maybe still exciting, but uh, not exciting enough to justify a mini quiz. <laughs> not self exciting, exactly. <laughs> um, right. Okay, so this covers the basics. Yeah, non negative, that is related to the self excitation. So you could have negative phi, which would mean that they have a self-regulation. So basically that means an event happens and that means for some time it's very unlikely that another event happens. Of course, you would have to take care a little bit that you know the total intensity still stays positive, but I'm just saying that that is not a priori useless. It's just something that we don't want to talk about in this uh, lecture here. <clears throat> okay, and what do I mean by this? Uh, we have introduced this kind of formula before. So I'm looking at the probability that the increment of the process from time t to time t plus h takes a value m conditional on everything that happened up to time t. And then that probability is uh, lambda t times h plus higher order terms if m is equal to one. And it's uh, a little o of h for m greater than one. And then of course, for m equals to zero, you get it by the, I mean, one minus blah, blah, blah. Okay, right. That's the definition of a Hox process. Any questions about this? Okay, that's something I already said. Um, if the L1 norm of phi was infinite, then you would have explosion in finite time. So basically the self excitation would be so, so uh, uh, exciting, <laughs> it would be so strong that after finite time you have NT equals infinity. And then if and this was the, the you know, the, the strong assumption that uh, I mentioned before. If the L1 norm of phi is greater than one, what happens is the expected intensity grows to infinity. And that per se, I mean, there's nothing wrong about that, right? It means it's, uh, as I realized when I prepared some of the, some of the figures here, it makes implementation very difficult because you run into this regime that you know if you wait for long enough time, the number of jumps will become very, very high. And if that happens due to the self excitation, this will trigger even higher number of jumps a little bit uh, later, right? I mean, what I'm basically trying to say is the amount of time that your code will run will grow exponentially in the time. <laughs> If you don't make approximations, right? If you want to simulate all, if you want to get exact simulation of the uh, uh, jump times. But otherwise, this is uh, not a problem, except that in many modeling situations, we want to require something like stationarity. And of course, the background here is that, you know, usually zero is like an artificially chosen point in time. We don't model processes which really start at time zero, but the idea is they started some time ago. It's just that we start looking at them at some point zero. And that means that, I mean, such a framework only makes sense if the process is uh, stationary in some way. Um, and to have stationarity of the, of the intensity in an asymptotic sense, you need the L1 norm of phi to be smaller than one. And in this case, in fact, there's a very nice formula for the expected value of lambda in the limit. At least uh, if it's not stationary, you should have collected enough information from the past to plot it. Yes. Which is also a reasonable. Case. Yes, absolutely. Okay, you may wonder what happens when the uh, uh, 
L1 norm is equal to one and uh, it's a bit tricky. <laughs> so it, I would say, shares a lot of features on both sides. Uh, uh, but as you can see, I mean, clearly the expected value of the intensity goes to infinity when the norm is in L1 norm, the phi is one. Yes, we will come. Yes, very true. We'll come to this on the next slide, I think. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. Um, in this case, when the L1 norm of phi is less than one, we will call it the stable case, so a stable Hox processes, Hox process. As Fabio already mentioned, uh, <laughs> there are really two especially important examples for kernels. The first one is the exponential kernel. And in the exponential kernel, I mean, you have something like a, a let's say, Champ Wanstrand Uhlenbeck process, right? I mean, if you put this kind of situation, this kind of kernel in a in a stochastic differential equation, you would have an Wanstrand Uhlenbeck process. And of course, we know an Wanstrand Uhlenbeck process is a Markov process. So the same thing actually happens here, and it's basically the same argument because you realize that for this particular choice of kernel, the intensity process satisfies an SDE. And since it satisfies an SDE, you have that the pair of processes, N and lambda, is a Markov process. So, you know, this is very nice. <laughs> it allows to do lots of things that, uh, I mean, basically, as I, as I explained earlier, a lot of our techniques rely on the Markov property. And now we have a Markov process. We can use all these different techniques. We get a lot of. Becomes a hidden Markov process, right? It becomes a hidden Markov process, okay. yes. Yes, that's right. Here, stability means beta, so the rate at which you forget is larger than alpha. The other very important kernel is the power law kernel. Uh, we have seen this already in the Omori law, an example of a power law kernel. Some people will tell you, and I mean, I this is one example of a power law kernel, but we will learn later. You could also remove the one here, have a power law kernel which has a singularity. Um, but here, I mean, yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, and of course, if you ever talk with physicists, you know that they love power laws. So maybe that's why the power law kernel is the second very, very popular choice of kernel. I, mean, I think they love power laws for good reasons, but <laughs> nonetheless, um, right. Let's look at an example. So uh, actually all my examples, I use an exponential kernel. I don't think it makes a difference for those examples. I'm not using the Markov property, but uh, uh, yeah. And what do you see here? We see once again here, the black crosses are the jump times. The blue line is the counting process. And the red line is the intensity. And you see it very well. I mean, first of all, if you look at the red scale here on the right-hand side, you see that the lower, this lower level here is something like three. This is the baseline intensity, the mu. If you go back here, we have the mu. That's the baseline intensity, right? And at some point, a jump happens. At this, until now, we have a homogeneous puzzle process. Nothing happened yet. And you see, when the jump happens, the intensity shoots up. It shoots up, but then exponentially fast, because I'm using the exponential kernel, 
it goes down again. And in this case, this guy did not trigger any new jumps. It happens. We wait a long time until the next jump, which is basically, again, by this time, we are essentially, again, a homogeneous puzzle process. I mean, it's not really true, but, you know, the, you know this, this guy, basically, we have almost forgotten about its existence. So the jump happens, intensity shoots up. This time, while the intensity is, is still very high, we trigger another jump. Intensity shoots up, story repeats. And you see that basically we here have a whole cluster of jumps happening. But we also see here, and to some extent also here, this is really a stable process in the sense that jumps also, this kind of events, this cluster also have a chance of, of dying out again. And, you know, going back to the, it's not like uh, uh, once we start activity, we will we'll, uh, move out to infinity. No. Is it a stable case? It is a stable case. You will see the difference. Yeah. I mean, okay, this is from zero to one. So maybe you wouldn't see the difference necessarily on this scale. But I promise if you zoom out a little bit, you will see the difference very easily. Uh, okay. And this is uh, from the earthquake paper by Ogata. Uh, the uh, intensity that he estimated for this uh, 100 years of data using a power law kernel. And I mean, it's maybe not too surprising, but we see actually, if I look at this, uh, 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 at this data, the, the forgetting is still very, very fast. So if you look at it like this, if I didn't know it, I would actually think this is an exponential kernel because the decay is so fast, but it is a power low kernel. And you very clearly see the spikes of intensity that we expect to see in this kind of data. Okay. I've talked about clusters and there is actually a, an interpretation or a construction, alternative construction of Hox processes which go in this direction, in the direction of branching processes. So basically, you have so-called immigrants. Immigrants uh, arrive at the rates, arrive at the standard homogeneous personal process. And I don't know who came up with this notion of immigrants and children, but I think it's very classical in branching processes. So bear with me. Now, every immigrant and actually every person can have children and they produce offspring and they do this as a time inhomogeneous personal process with an intensity phi of t minus the original arrival time of that particular person, be it an immigrant, be it the offspring of an immigrant. And of course, in our case, this is a decreasing function, right, in time. All of this happens independently of each other. And you see that there is a, there are clusters. Clusters basically denote all the offspring of one person, let's say of one immigrant, all the offspring that this immigrant produces is a cluster, but they're also generations. So for instance, immigrants are generation zero, offspring of immigrants are generation one, offspring of uh, particles of generation one are generation two, etc. And the process itself is, well, is the union of all those events. Right. And the expected number of, of uh, children or of offspring is exactly the L1 norm of phi. 
this is clear because it's a time inhomogeneous Poisson process and you take the integral over the intensity. Okay. And now, again, if the L1 norm of phi is smaller than one, then the total progeny of each e event is almost truly finite. I don't know why I'm missing the T in all of these events. <laughs> uh, if uh, uh, the L1 norm is greater than one, then the progeny can be infinite with positive probability. Okay. And this is now a cluster representation of a Hox process. So what you see here is different colors in different clusters. And on the y-axis, you see the generation number. You still have the crosses mean the mean all the events, right? So basically what happens is first nothing happens. Then at around 0 0.4, we have a first immigrant arriving. This immigrant has two offspring, two children. I mean, potentially it could have more. We only observe until time one, but actually I doubt this because you know the exponential kernel decreases very, very fast. So probably no more children to come, but who knows? I mean, sometimes parents can be quite old <laughs> and still have children. Um, okay. So that's the uh, the first immigrant, the first uh, offspring. The first offspring doesn't seem to have any children, but the second offspring actually has two children. So now we are in the uh, grandchildren generation, and it goes on. So this first immigrant has a very big family in the end until time one. Now, at this point here, around 0 0.5, there's actually a second immigrant arriving. This second immigrant apparently is not so lucky, doesn't have any children. Now, at some point, I mean, in between, you always have the children, grandchildren, grandgrandchildren, and so on happening of the first immigrant. But at some point, there's a third immigrant, the, the green guy, and the green guy has children grandchildren, even a grand-grandchild, but apparently there it stops. And again, you know, you could have more later on, but... And finally, there's another immigrant at some point. Of course, you see that also from this cluster representation, you see the self-excitation. The self-excitation comes in because we have this time inhomogeneous decreasing intensity uh, uh, processes happening here. Right. And if you look at that realization produced by this, actually, I'm using a different algorithm here. I'm, I'm really simulating the clusters because I wouldn't know how else to find out the clusters. I mean, I guess you can do like conditional probability stuff, but if you really want to know, okay, this is the cluster, this is the this is the uh, parent of that child or the other way around, I mean, you have to, to, to simulate it uh, like this, right? And you can do it. And actually part of your homework will be, if you want to do it. Uh, and actually, I mean, I, yeah, I have provided the functions which generate this kind of plot. So basically, only thing you have to do is to is to simulate the, the trajectories. Yeah, and for this particular trajectory, that would be uh, the other type of, of plot that we see. So we see the, the intensity as well as the counting process. And well, I am basically, you know, it looks very different actually from the first, I mean, if you keep in mind, it looks very different from this trajectory. And indeed there is a lot of variety, but you know, even when you when you plot standard boring Poisson process, you actually see that they can. It's not like Brownian motion, where basically you feel if I've seen one trajectory, I've seen them all. That they can look quite different. And here it's a, a very different picture. So here the kind of the events are somehow seems more regularly happening than in the other case. But yeah, 
actually the parameters are the same if I'm not mistaken. So it really has the same distribution. Okay. Um, some theoretical, yes, Fabio, please. Are you saying that any process can be part of this? Yes. Or any process is exponential? No, any Hobbes process. Right. Um, I want to show you two uh, structural theoretical results that are very important for uh, analysis of these processes. First one is a law of large numbers. So what happens is as time goes to infinity, we look at the number of events and we subtract from it its mean, or rather its asymptotic mean. This is not actually the mean, it's the asymptotic mean multiplied by t. It's the expected value, if the asymptotic of the expected value of the intensity to be more precise, multiplied by t. And we see that if we rescale by time and take actually, we, we converge to zero. And this is actually even happening on a process level. So, if, you know, you can take soup over u from zero to one, and this will still happen. Okay. I mean, clearly the same thing is, I mean, I don't know if you have seen it, but for a homogeneous Poisson process, this would also be true. In fact, it's a special case of this, but uh, uh, it's one of the important properties of Poisson processes. Um, I'm not going to show you a proof, but basically there are two parts of this argument. The first argument is you note that, and this is again a very general fact about counting processes, if we, the counting process has a compensator, and the compensator is nothing but the integrated intensity. So what this means if, is if I subtract the integrated intensity from the counting process, I get a martingale. And for martingales, we have lots of uh, techniques available. In particular, we have the dupe inequality. And of the dupe inequality, you can show the convergence at the level of the actual expected value. And then you derive a formula for the expected value. And uh, for this formula, I'm not going to go into any kind of details, but you notice uh, we have mu t which is for the Poisson process, for the homogeneous Poisson process. And then you have this interesting looking integral. And Psi here is the sum of all the convolution powers of phi. And this is related to uh, uh, very powerful techniques that Eduardo will talk about um, in the context of the solvents of kernels. So there's a whole calculus of this kind of kernels. Um, and yeah. And this is the first glimpse, I guess, of um, this calculus. Yes, will come on the next slide. <laughs> yes, to be expected. <laughs> you see, I mean, here I have a, a, a stable hoax process. Actually, it's the same hoax process. I, I'm, I mean, I'm a laser person. I always use the same parameters here. Uh, and I zoom out from zero to 10,000 and I plot NT versus T times uh, the long-term mean of the intensity. And, you know, it's just beautiful. <laughs> Works like a charm. If on the other hand, you are in the unstable case and your L1 norm is bigger than uh, uh, one, and you see something like this. And note that I went to time 1000 here. <laughs> I just can go to time two because after that, I mean, you know, if you wanted to go even to time 10, I would probably have to wait hours, if not weeks, for this 
simulation to be done, even though I'm only doing one trajectory. Yeah. I mean, of course, this increase here exponentially blows up. So increasing exponential rate. Yes. I don't actually know. Uh, do you know? Good question. <laughs> Good question. Okay, central limit theorem as requested. You know, I take your uh, suggestions very seriously. <laughs> um, okay, so now we have this difference that we've seen before, and now we scale it by multiplying with square root of capital T. So in other words, instead of dividing by capital T, we only divide by square root of capital T. And now we see this converges to a Brownian motion. So in fact, I even give you a functional central limit theorem with some uh, volatility in front, which is again given in terms of, of mu and the L1 norm of phi. And um, the proof relies on a martingale central limit theorem. So again, we are looking at the martingale uh, representation of the Hobbes process. And basically, there is a very general theorem which says if you have a sequence of uh, cut like martingales, and I assume that the expected jumps go to zero. I mean, of course, our martingale here has jumps. So, you know, we need to do something about jumps. The jumps have to go to zero. Otherwise, of course, they couldn't converge to a Brownian motion. I mean, the jumps go to zero, and the quadratic variation converges pointwise to some deterministic function. And if you only have those two components, then you have convergence of your martingales against a time-changed Brownian motion. And you see that both assumptions, if you think about it, are pretty necessary because you know quadratic variation of Brown of Brownian motion is a deterministic function. I mean that's actually T. So it's the identity function. So, you know, okay. And if you apply this to our situation here and you do some uh, 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 calculations, you end up with this central limit theorem. So can we verify this? Well, again, I, I, lose, I use the same process as before. This is what I get. Um, if you ignore what happens here, I would say it looks like a Brownian motion. This spike here initially is a bit weird. But of course, I mean, we didn't go to infinity, right? So if you look at the histogram, let's say of the terminal value, it actually looks normal, normal distribution. Right. And should we make a break 10, now or 10-15? Yes. Yeah. So you say when? Yeah, okay. Maybe maybe I need another 10 minutes now and then okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So we 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 continue and uh, <laughs> we maybe make the break a bit longer afterwards. Okay. okay. So how do we simulate hoax processes? Well, let me start by a reminder, how did we actually simulate Poisson processes? There are actually a bunch of methods and uh, to make it a bit, to, to narrow it down, I'm actually looking for exact simulation here. Okay. And basically uh, two main methods that I know are, first of all, you can use that the interrival at times are exponentially distributed. So you just start simulating, you start with an exponential random number, this gives you the first uh, uh, event time. And I'll add another exponential random variable gives you, if you add it to the first, it gives you the second jump time and so on. And you continue until you have exceeded capital T. 
Or alternatively, you first simulate the total number of jumps n capital T. This is a Poisson random variable. And then if that gives you m, little m, then you simulate m uniformly distributed random variable on the interval from zero to capital T and order them. And this gives you your jump times. Okay. How about inhomogeneous possible process? You will see the common theme is whatever we do, we reduce to the earlier case. So for the inhomogeneous Poisson process, there are two methods that I want to mention. So first we can transform it to a homogeneous Poisson process, basically by inverting the integrated uh, uh, intensity. So if you invert the integrated intensity, you actually get the homogeneous Poisson process with intensities one, constant one. Second uh, method, I mean, you see, this will be, this is relatively easy for the inhomogeneous Poisson process because lambda is known, you know lambda. It depends on T, but it's, not, it's known. For a Hox process, this will be a bit more tricky because you don't know lambda. <laughs> I mean, of course, you know it like over time. I mean, you know it from now until the next jump time, but. So instead, I would rather use the second method, the so-called thinning method. So the idea of the thinning method is you pick a very fast homogeneous Poisson process. So assume that your intensity is bounded from above. And I, you have a bound nu for the intensity. You first simulate the homogeneous Poisson process with intensity nu. And then for every jump time that it gives you, you either accept it or you reject it. And you do this by basically comparing with the intensity. So you simulate the uniform distributed random variable from zero to new. And if that one is larger than the intensity of your inhomogeneous Poisson process, then you reject. So you simply remove the jump time. If it's not, then you accept it and you keep it as a jump time of inhomogeneous Poisson process. But in this context, the lambda does it have, I mean, in principle, I mean, it, it, it can have an excursion, right? I mean, it can go, uh, how, how do you actually pick a node that is deterministic and it has? I mean, we are still in the inhomogeneous Poisson process. Ah, okay, okay, that's sorry. <laughs> I was thinking of that. Yeah, 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 no. Uh, It's only this, this, uh, yes. this kind of thing that you have to do with the Yes, yes. Some but you're making a very good point. You're all too far away. <laughs> we are not even yet there at the Hox <laughs> process case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't jump ahead. Okay. No. <laughs> Um, okay, now for the Hox process there, I, I'm presenting two methods. The first method is based on the cluster representation. For this method, we have all the ingredients already on the table. Because remember, immigrants follow a homogeneous puzzle process. We know how to simulate that. And for each event that happened, we simulate offspring by an inhomogeneous Poisson process with this rate. And we know how to do that. This is just an inhomogeneous Poisson process. All the things are conditionally independent from each other. So, okay, you just keep track of everything. And it's done. The second one is the thinning method. And here, a very natural assumption is that phi is decreasing. Again, the idea is a event happened and has a big impact and over time you forget. If you have this assumption, then coming to your question, phi of zero is an upper bound, is an upper bound for uh, phi of t. 
And therefore, what you can do is the following. Okay, the first jump time is again the first jump time of a homogeneous Poisson process. We know what to do. And after that, given the history, we simulate the first jump time of an inhomogeneous Poisson process with the thinning method with an upper bound given by the impact of the memory, the, the intensity at time TK. Okay, that's what's going on. So basically conditioning on FTK until the next jump time, what we are dealing with is actually a time inhomogeneous person process with a deterministic intensity, which decreases, why, which is why we can take its value at time TK as our upper bound for the thinning method. Yes, it can. Yeah. It can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 I think the. I take some preference. That's right. I think the thinning is actually the prevalent method, and I can tell you from experience, it's much faster than the cluster. I, in my not very sophisticated implementation, <laughs> I don't know what you can do if you really try hard, but uh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, uh, the advantage is, you know, I think this transformation method is doable if you have a nice closed form expression for capital lambda. If you don't, then the thinning, I think, is just more easy. And in the thing, you assume per assumption about uh, the size and the mode compared to yes. the cluster, you not the same thing. That's true, but this assumption is very, very natural. I wouldn't, I mean, I mean, what you really need is you need an upper bound for the intensity, right? I mean, given the, given no, for a conditional upper bound of the intensity until the next jump time. And I mean, even for, I mean, I cannot even think of, of why you would not want the decreasing kernel, but even for a non for a kernel, which is not necessarily decreasing, uh, if you know such an upper bound and, and if you don't, then it's probably an unstable anyway. <laughs> I mean, if it just increases, you know, um, anyway. Okay, I think, yeah, let's stop here maybe. I'm not completely sure how many more slides I have on for this. Any questions at this point? Then enjoy the break. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, the last thing I wanted to mention about hoax processes is inference. So, how can we statistically estimate uh, parameters? And, you know, we basically have two parameters, right? If we go back to the, well, or let me not go back and instead use the whiteboard, um, we have lambda t is equal to mu plus integral phi s v n s. And that means, our two parameters are mu and phi. And of course, for instance, in the parametric forms for the exponential kernel and the power law kernel, what you would actually have is that phi itself is a function of, let's say, two or three parameters. So then your parameters mu would be mu and whatever parameters determine phi. Okay. When preparing for this talk, I came over this nice quote 
from a paper with Filimino, Filimin, Filimonov and uh, Sarnet. Our overall conclusion is that calibrating the Hox process is akin to an excursion within a minefield that requires expert and careful testing before any conclusive step can be taken. I think that in particular refers to financial data. So maybe uh, earthquake data is nicer, I'm not sure. It's actually a point that uh, one could discuss a little bit because you know, when you look at financial data at first glance, you would see this is actually very nice data because there are no measurement errors. I mean, you know, it's just it's just the, the, the pure data. There are no measurements error. Usually the data or often the data sets are very big. Uh, and they are cheap to produce. I mean, unfortunately, and this is another issue about financial data. They're usually produced by companies whose purpose is to sell this data. <laughs> so, you know, it costs money. Uh, but generally speaking, it's not like that you have to do, you know, uh, expensive machinery or uh, travel to faraway country to take some specimens or something like this, which is inherently very costly and inherently limited to very small data sets. But actually, uh, you get lots of data. And it seems in some sense, it, your problem is maybe the opposite, that somehow you have too much data and it's like finding a needle in a haystack. But anyway, okay. So very, very basically, I want to discuss two methods uh, to do inference on parameters of a Hox process. First one is maximum likelihood uh, estimation. And those of you familiar with uh, how to estimate parameters in a Poisson process, will find these formulas uh, familiar. Likelihood function, and here I use, uh, I use the bar values for the unknown parameters. So mu bar is the parameter you want to estimate, phi bar the same. And I use, uh, where is it? Yeah, I use lambda bar would then be the function of those two parameters uh, in contrast to the true underlying unobserved intensity process lambda. Okay, so basically uh, the likelihood function is given by this formula. You have a, so basically the idea is we observe a trajectory of a Hox process, which has the jump times T1 up to TK on our interval. Then the intensity, then the, the likelihood is the product of the intensity multiplied by the exponential function of minus the integral over the intensities. And the intensity as a function of mu and phi follows this form. But again, this is the parametric ansatz for intensity and the parametric ansatz and the parameter as a function of the parameters. Now, the second very nice estimation procedure is called the contrast function. And here the idea is <clears throat> you minimize the difference between two terms. The first term is the squared integ the integral of the squared intensity function. And the second term is twice two times the integral of the intensity functions versus the jump versus the counting process. And this looks a bit weird at first glance, but you realize what's going on is if you take expectations, Take expectations, okay? In the first part, nothing happens. But in the second part, you know that if you take the expectation of such an integral against the counting process, it's the same as taking expectation over the integral and multiply with the intensity and integrate over time. And this now, that's why I do this clumsy lambda bar notation. This now is the true intensity, the underlying process. Okay, and now you see there is a quadratic here. So let's complete the square by adding the expected value of lambda t squared here. And you get this. And now you realize what you're doing in the second approach is you minimize the L2 distance between lambda as a function of the parameters and the true lambda. 
behind it. And this is not just a starting point. There has been lots of work, especially in the econophysics and uh, financial economics literature on how to estimate uh, Poisson processes, uh, box processes, sorry. Again, we see when the gets large, Convergence to some kind of mean yes, 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 that's the thinking. So we're thinking of the stationary case here. <clears throat> right. Now, the whole discussion was about scalar box processes. So, of course, as we have seen in, 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 in the little motivational story that I told, uh, but also in the, in the, in the earthquake uh, case, there are some very important and useful generalizations of this Hox process uh, uh, concept. So the first one is you can have a multidimensional Hox process. And the thing to keep in mind here is, I mean, everything is, is, is immediately generalized, right? You have B processes which have this form. And now you see you have memory kernels which interact which introduce interaction between the different components of the multidimensional process. That's very natural because if you think about this limit order book or the straight execution uh, story, you can obviously imagine that you know a by order arriving can trigger cell orders and the other way around. So it makes a lot of sense to, to allow for interaction here. Um, so that's the first, and then basically the story that I told you is basically the same. I mean, for instance, the L1 would still be an L1 uh, norm, just that you have to add a, uh, a matrix norm on top of it, you know? Um, okay. The second example, and here we think particularly about the earthquake model, is a marked Hox process. And of course, this is a, also a very classical thing. You know, you have a point process, you add marks to the point process. And here in the earthquake model, and this is the so called ETAS model, very famous model, uh, the marks would be the magnitude of the earthquake. So basically, um, for each event, the event, the jump time would be okay, the time of a, of a shock. And then you also simulate a corresponding magnitude. And again, it makes a lot of sense to think that the magnitude has an effect on the intensity. Because a large magnitude shock could trigger more aftershocks, for instance. Makes a lot of sense, I think. Could there be any situation where it's useful to actually use some integrated integral in the, in the lambda with respect to the different DNIs, for example? It, yes, uh, that's basically was, I mean, one approach would be, I think, kind of this nonlinear equation where if you multiply it out, I think you get iterated integrals. But yes, absolutely. There's also quadratic box. Yeah. Okay. And they are used uh, by uh, people. Uh, cool. Very recently, I think, in yes. the last years. Yes. Where they mix the NU, the NS. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you can also model this with space, I mean, because in earthquakes, I mean, we could have the aftershocks also depends on the neighbor. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. And actually, this is also done so that you have like an additional uh, space component. And I'm not sure now, but it may be that the actual ETAS model has that. So maybe I'm lying here. <laughs> uh, okay, and finally, nonlinear Hox processes. And we have come to that discussion a little bit earlier already, but you know, nothing stops you from taking your formula for the intensity, but then applying an arbitrary, or not an arbitrary, but a, a nonlinear function on top of it and let this be your intensity. And this is also a very popular class of models. Uh, 
of course, once you introduce this intensity, a lot of the structure will be lost, I guess. So unlike the first two examples, which I think don't change too much uh, 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 on the structural properties, on the simulation methods, et cetera, this last one will change something. So, but of course it also gives you a lot of uh, uh, flexibility. And that actually ends the first part on Hox processes. Any questions or comments? You answered the same way. I, I, I was not paying this attention. The, what, what about the geographic and distribution of this? Uh, when you have to distribute the mass over space, what, what was your answer? I mean, you can essentially do another, you know, another almost like a spatial hox, spatial intensity hox structure, where basically, I'm sorry, where basically you say that the spatial distribution of your events depends on the spatial look on the location of the earlier events and you also have like a i don't know decreasing density the further away you go you have like a, a, on a, on a, have a uh, density there is a space and, 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 and time and you integrate over a certain domain and then you have hoax process associated to that domain i think so yes I mean, we could look it up. I mean, I think in this Ogata paper, because they have the, examples of space, right? You cannot isolate a single piece, right? Yes, that's right. So I'm thinking space you can isolate a piece and you can integrate the density. I mean, there's also, you know, I mean, this goes, you could also realize this here, right? Because here the idea is that the magnitudes are independent i mean the way i wrote it down here the magnitudes are independent from each other but of course you could say well a large magnitude event could trigger more large magnitude event i guess in this ogata case maybe this doesn't happen because you anyway truncate and only look at large magnitude events somehow but still i mean and I think uh, the question that you're asking is basically would be the same here if you say that earlier magnitudes influence magnitudes of the later events and that you could have something like a memory also not only in the time but also in the magnitude. And also as Eduardo uh, alerted me to in the, in the break, if you have a self-regulating process instead of a self-exciting process, you probably need a non-linearity somewhere here, because otherwise you could get negative uh, uh, intensities, which are not good. <laughs> but uh, yeah. All right. The next part. In the next, I think I have an hour left, right? Or something like that. Until 12. Until 12. Okay, less than an hour, but I think I, I will be managed. Um, well, in the next part, so this concludes the first big example of non Markov processes in modeling and in particular in financial modeling. Um, the next example that I want to motivate today and that Eduardo will discuss in much more detail tomorrow is basically fractional models. And in particular in, in finance, I mean, fractional models have been around for decades, of course. I mean, Mandelbrot in the 60s, I think really pushed for, for them and they have been around and since then. And actually, I think even earlier, Kolmogorov did groundbreaking works. So they have been around for, for, let's say, almost 100 years. But quite recently, uh, say eight, nine years ago, uh, they became very popular. There was like re-emergence in financial mathematics in particular in the context of volatility. And I want to... to 
want to tell a little bit the story as it evolved back then. So what did trigger people who believe that or come to the conclusion that this kind of fractional non-Markov models are useful to model uh, stock price? And let me start. I mean, I'm aware that many people here do not work with financial data. So I'm trying to, to go very slow, but still, again, don't hesitate at all to interrupt me if anything is unclear. So let's begin with a time series of basically the most important index, stock index in the world, the S&P 500 index, over, uh, yeah, what is that, maybe uh, 16 years. And okay, what can we say about that? I guess what we can say is that, well, first of all, this looks stochastic. I mean, it makes sense from a conceptual point of view, while the market will only ever show you one single realization, still, if you look into the future, you try to predict what's happening, you basically have no idea. I don't know. Of course, maybe some people who are more clever or spend more time thinking about what could happen, maybe they have a bit more idea than from anybody else, but at the end of the day, you know, we are all in the same boat, you don't know. So maybe that's the first uh, uh, thing to, to require of a meaningful model of a financial market is that it should be stochastic. The second one is, and this is also, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm not talking about deep concepts. I'm talking about really, really, really basic stuff. Prices are non-negative. I mean, you can make a, a, a fancy, no arbitrage style argument about this, but I think it really makes a lot of sense. Now, I guess you could say, okay, but what if the company gets bankrupt or just stops operating? Yeah, then you get zero, but then you also don't come back. Um, finally, Look at this, you could say, well, this looks like a continuous in time and continuous in space object. And again, realize, thinking back about the first lecture, this is an idealization. But, you know, if you scale that out uh, far enough, which could actually be on the level of days, I guess, or maybe even intraday, if it's... Um, let's say at the level of days or more, then it sounds like a very reasonable uh, assumption. Um, and then, so these were very basic ones, but uh, then if you go more into theory, you will realize that things become very complicated or yeah, very complicated, let's put it like this, if your price process is not the same in Martingale. So there are some self inconsistencies. If you don't have a semi martingale, you can lift those self inconsistencies. For instance, if you if you make the very reasonable assumption that there are always transaction costs, but let's not go there. The prices are semi martingales, right? And if we think about all these requirements and we want to come up with the most basic model we can think of that satisfies this, we might come up with a geometric Brownian motion. Okay, and this is a very, very well-known model. It's called the Black-Scholes, so also the Black-Scholes-Merton model. But I would like to point out that even though black uh, well, who was it? Scholes and Merton. I think Black was dead by the time. Got the Nobel Prize in economics for this. They actually did not get it for writing down this equation. Because this equation is really, really basic. I mean, and it was actually known and it was used before them. Like Samuelson and even before, I think, definitely used equations like this. What they, what they got it for was um a replication argument and uh, we will come well, hopefully come back to this <laughs> later <laughs> today 
Okay, so you see here in this model, we have two parameters. We have mu, the rate of return, and we have uh, sigma, the volatility. And I actually want to concentrate on sigma here today. Why? Um, um, okay. I think there are two answers to this question. Why? The first answer, if you look at uh, time series uh, like this, then mu, while it's certainly very important, is very difficult to estimate. That's the one first answer. It's too difficult to estimate. The second answer is when it actually comes down to uh, pricing derivatives, the funny thing is we don't need to know it. As I will also hopefully explain to you later, we don't need to know it. So when it comes down to pricing derivatives, actually sigma is the only parameter we actually need. Unfortunately, sigma is actually quite easy to estimate. Because we know the quadratic variation, right? The quadratic variation of the log. And of course, the log is nothing but a Brownian motion with drift. The log can be, is defined as the limit of what uh, in finance terms would be the realized variance. That is, you take uh, 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 a grid of times, you take the quadratic uh, returns, sum them up, and this in the limit gives you sigma squared t, or if you want the integral of sigma squares with respect to dt, right? I mean, imagine that uh, sigma, if sigma was a time dependent function, then as it will be eventually, we will have like a, a diffusive and a more general SD, then you, this would still hold, but you would get uh, the integral over the time dependent, actually maybe stochastic sigma. Okay. This is very, very well understood and you can write down rates of convergence and everything, but in real life, things are much more tricky. And this is related to this kind of story that I told you that actually markets are discrete in nature, both in time and in space. And this discrete nature induces what is sometimes called market microstructure noise. And this noise basically uh, makes this very standard and simple estimation task to actually something that even after 20 years, you can still write research papers on, and it's not at all, I mean, not at all obvious how to do it. And generally speaking, I don't want to, to go into details, but basically you could imagine that all your price observations that you have like on top of this STI, you always have an epsilon I, an error. I mean, again, it's not really an error because you have perfect observation of the prices. That's not the issue, but you can treat it as if there was an error. And now the problem is if you make this answer and you make a really, really fine time grid, you see that at some time scale, the error starts to dominate. You don't have any signal more anymore. You only have noise. So what do you do? Basically, you use, for instance, you use two time scales to basically subtract the two noise estimators which you get, and then basically the signal remains. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's quite a lot of known about this, uh, how to do this. And uh, bottom line is uh, you, you can do it, but you get pretty bad rates of convergence. Let's put it like this. And yeah. In the end, what you get is something like this. So uh, this is like Sigma. 
let's say on a daily basis, and it's actually realized variance. So strictly speaking, this is not sigma. So it's something like this. It's something like this. Uh, think about it like this. You have D S T is equal to some drift that we don't care about at the moment. Then we have a diffusion part driven by a Brownian motion set with the term square root of VT in front. So if here instead we have a constant, and if we also have a linear form here, then we get the geometric Brownian motion back. Right. And what we see here is something like uh, integral from, let's say, PI, PI plus one. Vs, Vs. This is somehow, and then probably with a square root, and probably scaled to yearly terms. I'm actually not sure <laughs> about the last one, but uh, that very well be scaled. Right. And what do we see here? Um, I would say. Just like in the first picture, this looks very stochastic. Doesn't look constant at all. And uh, that basically what that means is that, you know, this picture here is too simple. Because imagine if you have here instead of the sigma WT, I mean, what? What you basically would have here is st is s zero exponential, and now let me let me make this concrete. Let's say we still have mu st dt, and you would have here mu minus one half. Integral from zero to t vs vs and t sorry uh, plus integral zero t square root vs t set s something like this and of course <clears throat> if we plug in here something random. This is no longer log normally distributed. Because then, I mean, if you plug in some a random process here, this is no longer normally distributed. Um, okay. So that picture here was too simple. So we see V, our, our, our volatility, and sometimes you see, as sometimes you use sigma and this use V. V stands for variance and sigma would stands for volatility. So basically sigma is square root of V. Sorry for that, but <laughs> that's just how it is. We also see that this actually looks a bit strange if you are used to seeing Brownian motion for uh, diffusion processes. So first of all, of course, or not of course, but we want a volatility which is non-negative. You could actually think, that, I mean, if you think about it, if here you have a negative number, nothing changes because you can say, you know, I just observe the negative sign into the Brownian increment. So actually the volatility from that point of view doesn't need to be non-negative. It could be negative. But by convention, we kind of think of volatility and variance. I mean, you want variance to be, well, okay, variance is the square of the, of the volatility, so it's anyway non-negative. But, you know, volatility, if you, you want to think of it as a standard deviation, and therefore you want to think, think of it as something non-negative. So basically, it seems that it's very often close to zero. 
but then there are these huge spikes and generally speaking i mean it's very hard of course i know if you want to wish you can visualize crazy crazy things which are simply not true but with all with all the the the, the care that and with all the care that one has to take that actually looks maybe a bit rougher than a brownian path yeah okay on the other hand if you look at and this is again a, a kind of stylized fact uh, if you look at the distribution of volatilities then they actually look fairly close to log normal so you know if it's not true for the for the stock price maybe the black shows would be nice for the volatility who knows okay and you know if you if you want to understand the structure of a process like this better you might be tempted to look at scaling properties how does volatility scale for instance when you go from a weekly to a daily or to an hourly or i don't know time scale and I should give references here, but I don't. <laughs> um, one way to look at it, and this is actually a very simple, very straightforward way. Uh, and, you know, actually, the story that I'm telling you has been criticized by several people. Sometimes uh, as some criticism is justified, some other maybe not. And in any case, I mean, I'm not saying that this is the way to do, but it's a very simple way and it gives a compelling story. And I think in the end, personally, I feel it gives the correct answer. We have had a, a workshop last week in, in the Isle of Skye in Scotland, where there was again some big discussions about if the answer is really the right answer. But I think at least to leading order, it is the right answer. Eduardo may disagree. <laughs> talk to him afterwards. <laughs> but in my talk, it is the right answer. <laughs> okay, so we try to understand the scaling. And for this, what we basically look is we look at uh, log returns and log increments of the volatility process. And bear in mind, the log volatility process, unlike the asset price process, is not something that you can observe. This is actually the product of a sophisticated estimation process, right? And this is actually one of the reasons why the story that I'm telling you here is a little bit, you know, unstable or debatable, yeah. But anyway, yes. Yes, the Q is, is, is ah, okay, yeah, yeah, sorry, is a power, yes, you're right, thank you, sorry, yes, of course, there's a power Q missing, and, uh, okay, what is the story, the story is, if, uh, when we basically uh, divide this by the time scale to the power Q, with some alpha and we get the finite limit as the time scale goes to zero we realize that the process sigma is alpha helder continuous so it's it's a scaling behavior in that sense so we're trying to find the regularity of the of the sample path and to see this and i'm simplifying simplifying the story a lot here i will just look at this i will Remove the sum and I just take expectations. Okay. And again, of course, you're relying on some kind of stationarity behavior here. If you do this and you suppose that actually it's really true that sigma is an exponential Brownian motion, then there's a new missing uh, uh, here. Uh, you see uh, that at the end of the day, the important thing that comes up here is the delta to the q over two and remember basically we are looking for the alpha that multiplies to q here so the alpha is one half and of course we know this because brownian motion as a regularity is one half holder or more precisely 
is alpha Hölder for every alpha smaller than one half. And if you replace the Brownian motion, say, okay, of course this didn't work. Let's just use a diffusion process instead of it. Well, similar, same, same answer. On the other hand, and Eduardo will introduce fractional Brownian motion in full detail. But just now I'm just saying there is a process, fractional Brownian motion, which has this scaling behavior. So uh, uh, the increments are normally distributed, but with a, with a variance delta to the 2h. Okay, and of course, if you plug this in, you get the factor h times q. Yeah, I said this already, um, h times q. And basically you, you estimate this using estimates the, the the factor in the q and you see this 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 plots this this uh, uh, this this uh, estimators m they really follow quite uh, this kind of power law behavior here i mean on a log log scale this means that what you want to see is straight lines and that looks quite like straight lines i would say and then the next question is so this is saying that there is, a, say, alpha such that mq delta behaves like delta to the power alpha. Now, of course, what the next one to understand is, is that alpha as a function of q, is it linear? So are the slopes here as a function of q, are they linear? And then it turns out, yes, they are. I mean, that also works quite well. You do a regression at this point. I didn't want to write down the formula. And then you can do it for a bunch of indices. And you see that basically the age that you get is usually around 0 0.1. And you know, age one half would be the Brownian case or the diffusion case. And we are far away from that. We are much rougher. And there are papers where people use is for a thousand of individual stocks, thousands of individual stocks, and a similar picture emerges. So you consistently get h, which are smaller than a half, and actually considerably smaller than a half. And again, let's try to visualize what's going on here. On the top, I have uh, uh, the log volat the log volatility as estimated from data, and this is a, 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 another goal. And here, uh, if there is a trajectory of a fraction orange and Lundbeck process of h equals zero point one, I mean, of course, there is no clear fit, and you see differences. But if you concentrate on the roughness, it looks very similar. I would say. I mean, if I were to plot the Brownian motion here, it would look much smoother, much less variability, much less, you know. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. So uh, the story, but uh, Eduardo, I'm, I'm not going to talk about fractional Brown. I mean, uh, uh, to tell this motivating story here without mentioning fractional Brownian motion would be a bit strange. On the other hand, mentioning fractional Brownian motion without, without first motivating it, okay, could also be done, I guess, but I think we decided to first do the motivation and then come to the actual properties of the process. So uh, yes, but you're right. So positive uh, age greater than one half means that increments are positively correlated. Age smaller than a half means that increments are negatively correlated. And of course, that is very much related to this roughness because you know, Im imagine if you have negatively correlated inc increments. Of course, this means that you have a large ten tendency to have wild oscillations. Okay. Second part of the story. Um, so, so far, what we have looked at is 
uh, the prices of the underlying uh, stock or index. It's usually nicer to work with indices. You don't have issues like, for instance, dividend payments and stuff like this, but also the, like the big indices like uh, S&P 500 is really very, very liquid, but anyway. Um, so we have looked at the price prices of an underlying stock or index, and we have tried to understand, like say, fine properties of this price. Um, now we want to look at the same at the same process, but from a very different point of view, also using very different uh, sorts of data. And that is, we want to look at uh, options and the prices of options on this underlying. Okay, and for this, I want to step back and say a few words about the really fundamental background on how option pricing works. And in particular, I want to uh, highlight a little bit why this rate of return mu is actually not needed for the option pricing, which is why we can get away with concentrating on sigma alone. Um, and I want to start here, very, very basic. Um, I want to consider, well, a one period binomial model. Let me ask who has, who has seen this kind of uh, discussion before? Let's say half, that's enough. I think uh, for half of the people, this is a very good opportunity to, <laughs> to show a little bit uh, here. Okay, so uh, this is like, uh, I think it's maybe the favorite model to teach these concepts for the first time, because it's really, you know, the most bareback and fundamental model that you can use actually. I mean, simplify this model in any way and you get a trivial problem. Um, okay, so we have a model. We look at the stock price over one period and the stock price can either go up with probability P or it can go down with probability one minus P. And in fact, I want to look at it a little bit more. Um, Or generally, maybe I, okay, was this supposed to happen? Okay. Um, I want to actually introduce instead of, I want to actually look at the case where we do have an interest rate. Um, anyway, so still we start at some value S zero at time equals zero, and we go to u s zero or b s zero with probability p and one minus p respectively. And uh, we also have a, pro we have a second, like a bank account. And the bank account, moves from one, okay, one, okay. This is not how I was told it would work, but anyway, <laughs> from one to E to the R, and there's no probabilities involved here. This is risk-free. Okay, so, what let's let's discuss a little bit what we need for this to kind of make sense okay and what, what do we what do we have is we have an option paying f of s1 at time t equals one and if you open like wikipedia it will tell you an option is a right but not an obligation so actually f of s1 is non-negative because if you would get something negative yeah, this will have to pay something you would simply opt not to exercise the option but i don't think that's actually important for this discussion okay 
So let's look a little bit at this uh, from for a second. Um, okay. By convention, I say u is greater than d because why not? I mean, if u is equal to d, then obviously, if you well, maybe we should make this. If u is equal to d, then what happens is that basically I have two risk-free accounts, and uh, you know the story is trivial nothing happens there is no randomness in the system whatsoever you know exactly what happens and basically unless the unless u is equal to er uh, there's arbitrage which means you borrow infinite amount of money from the, i mean if say u is equal to d and it's larger than e to the r you borrow infinite amount of money from the bank to invest it in your risky asset which is not risky you make infinite amount of profits and if that's the other way around it with the other way around so this is not important this is not interesting and now you see already where the story is going because you see that basically you need for this to be non-trivial you need d less than e to the r less than u otherwise you can play similar tricks you just you know if e to the r is smaller than d you uh, borrow infinite amount of money from the bank, you put it in the stock, no matter which outcome you win. Okay, so this is the only interesting case. And now we come to the argument because uh, for the sake of this story, the unknown, which corresponds to our two parameters in the black shows, mu and sigma, the unknown is P. So what do we need to know about P? And what I'm going to tell you is we don't need to know P. The answer is very simple. We don't need to know anything about P. Why? How, how on earth is this possible? Well, first of all, if you ask stochastically educated people about the price of such an option, I think that the answer you would get from many of them intuitively would be the expected value of f was s1. Because you know, we are trained in thinking of law of large numbers. Maybe if you heard, if you're ever taking a course in insurance mathematics, you heard the equivalence principle, which is the law of large numbers. But actually, this is the wrong answer. It's the wrong answer because this is an experiment that by definition only happens once. You cannot repeat the experiment. I and mean, you can repeat it like at later time, but then everything changed. I mean, in this image, there's no relation between time. If I, if I do the experiment now and I do it in one month, there's no relation between the two. So there's no repetition. We only do it once. Therefore, there's no justification for applying a law of large numbers. So this doesn't work. Instead, what you can ask for is you can ask, you can try to find a replicating portfolio. So I'm going to take a position in the bank account and another position in the stock. And I'm going to choose these two in such a way that at time one, the value of that portfolio is equal to the option value. What is the value of the bank position? It's phi zero times e to the r.
Okay. And now, of course, I can look at my probabilistic model and I realize there's only two possible outcomes, two possible values of S1 at time one. It's either U times S0 or D times S0. So actually, um, I will just continue up here. I guess I could, well, I could, I could move here. Yeah. How do I? Yeah. Oh, no, please show me. <laughs> ah, okay. Ah, okay, I see. Thank you. Yes. So if we if we translate this, we see we get phi zero e to the r plus phi one u s zero is equal to let's call it f u, which is f of u s zero, and we get phi zero e to the r plus phi one d s zero equals f d, which we define as f of d. S zero, and I'm rapidly running out of time. So therefore, I post this as a homework problem to figure this out. But of course, I mean we have a system of two linear equation with two unknowns, so we should be able to solve this. And and this is the magical part. Now I've prepared the solution somewhere, but I, I didn't take the sheet of paper with me here, so and I'm not going to improvise. But the point is, it turns out. So the option price. So this is the principle of let's say no arbitrage. So basically, at time one, the value of our portfolio that we constructed here is equal to the value of the option. Therefore, it has to be equal at time zero as well. Because, you know, if it was worth less, then you sell the, the portfolio and you buy the option or other way around, make free money. So V zero is the value of the option at time zero is equal to phi zero plus phi one, S0, which is the value of the portfolio. And it turns out if you write down the phi 0 and phi 1, this is equal to Q times e to the minus e to the minus R F of U S0 plus one minus Q e to the minus R F of D S zero for some value Q between zero and one. Okay. So, whatever <laughs> bottom line is v0 is equal to you see we made two mistakes in our uh our law of large numbers answers first we forgot to discount multiply with e to the minus r but secondly instead of taking expectations with our physical probabilities p and one minus p we have to change the probability measure <clears throat> to probabilities q and one minus q instead and note that the Q and one minus Q have nothing to do with the P. You don't need to know the P in order to determine the Q. 
And this is actually what Black and Scholes, uh, Scholes and Merton, got the Nobel Prize for understanding this argument in the context of the continuous time, but still understanding this argument that for option pricing, we don't actually need to understand what is, some, what is often called the physical probability measure, that is the dynamics of the stock price process, but we have to change measure. And we have to change measure, technically speaking, in a equivalent way. So there's an equivalent measure change. That means equivalent here means uh, the new measure is absolutely continuous with respect to the old measure and vice versa. And you realize that under a diffusion process or under geometric Brownian motion, that means we cannot change the sigma, but we can change the drift. And if you do the same kind of argument, and I don't have time for that, I would have done the argument. Otherwise, it's very simple. You can do it in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, you can see that actually the mu, the rate of return that you use for the option pricing, this is the uh, risk neutral measure, has to be R, has to be the risk free interest rate. And of course, those people who know math finance know that there's much, much more to this story. But at a very basic level, this is the reason why when we look at option pricing, we only need to care about sigma. We don't need to care about mu. Um, what can we do? Okay. Now, I've already told you that the Black-Scholes model is not very useful. I mean, it's not very accurate. Let's put it like this. I claim here it's still very useful. Um, and it's very useful because it provides a very natural uh, parametrization of prices. So basically what happens is, as we have seen, um, the Black-Scholes price of an option only depends on sigma. It's the only unknown parameter in this equation. I'm assuming here that you can observe the risk free interest rate. And I'm assuming here, and this is maybe a bit more tricky, that it's really a scalar number. And it's not like a term structure of interest rates which are stochastic and whatever, right? I mean, you make some assumptions here. And in this case, you realize that the option price actually is an increasing function in sigma. And this means, this is an invertible function of sigma. So what you can do is, if I, if I have an option with a certain market price new, or maybe model price, if I have a sophisticated pricing model, so I have an option with a certain price, and then I can re-express this price in terms of what is known as implied volatility. And the implied volatility is the solution to the equation here, where on the one side you have the price of the option, on the other side you have the Black Scholes price of the same option. And now you can look at whole surface, a whole bunch of options. Surfaces are very useful because we look here at, uh, for instance, call options. Maybe I should write down the payoff function. So for a call option, would have f of s equals s minus k positive part for some k, the strike price k fixed. And they exist for different times of expiration, capital T. So here from zero to roughly two years. And uh, log moneyness k, so the log moneyness k here is defined like this. So you take the logarithm of the strike price divided by the spot price. And then you get shapes like this. And again, you see this, you see why implied volatility is so nice because, you know, if you go deep out of the money, the option price is essentially zero. If you get deep in the money, the option price, I mean, so that would be very, very difficult to see some structure just, just alone from this reason. And this is a very informative surface. And you see, actually, the first thing you see is this is not flat. And this is yet another clear uh, evidence that the Black-Scholes model 
is not accurate because in the Black Scholes, if the Black Scholes model was true, this would be flat. So if you would see here a surface which is almost flat, you could see, well, the Black Scholes model is not doing a bad job, but clearly it does a bad job. We see huge differences. So what's the next thing you could do is let's look at stochastic volatility models. Again, in the first part, or in the first part of the second part, or in the first part of this hour here, we saw that volatilities actually look very stochastic, look very rough. And here we see, okay, so why not just say our oh, volatility is the solution of an SD? Well, variance is the solution of an SD. And this is a very nice class of models. You have a lot of flexibility. Having rich structures and distributions. And by the way, you could add jumps, right? You could add jumps, then you get even more flexibility. You have a lot of tractability because, again, for instance, you have pricing PDs. It's easy to simulate uh, the processes. Maybe in some specific instances, you have highly efficient Fourier pricing models. A lot of people here in this room can tell you more about each of these uh, 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 each of these uh, uh, methods and their advantages and disadvantages. There are nice asymptotic formulas, and maybe one example that Eduardo will focus a lot about tomorrow is the Heston model, where you have this specific uh, dynamics for the variance process. Which is, you know, something actually you know, very, very, very nice model. I mean, very nice properties. But, but it also doesn't quite do the job. And the reason why it doesn't do the job, before we go there, maybe, uh, you know, this surface, though it's very, very uh, informative, it's also a bit hard to understand what's going on, at least for me. Um, three dimensional images are quite complicated. So people look along a specific one dimensional kind of phrase if, of this uh, surface, if you like. And that is, you look at the derivative in this direction. In the log moneyness direction, you take the implied volatility, take the derivative in the log moneyness direction, and then evaluate it at spot at zero. It's the at the money in, uh, at the money implied volatility skew. So you see, I mean, somehow if you think a bit from a PDE point of view, the volatility is related to the second derivative. And this, if you take a derivative of the second derivative, you get a third derivative, which is why you could call it a skew. Uh, right. And you can, what you get then is a function of the maturity. Much nicer to think about because it only has one variable now. And what you see is here, the black dots are data and the red curve is now a power law fit to this data. And this is actually data which is quite a few years old nowadays. You could get much more data points. Uh, uh, but I claim that uh, the, the, the general picture is still the same. So you have this power law behavior. And you see the power law is almost like uh, this t to the minus alpha for alpha, which is almost one half. This at least is something that I know Eduardo will agree with. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and the problem here is uh, that's not something you can get in a diffusion stochastic volatility model. And uh, yeah, by the way, of course, in the Black Scholes case, this would be zero this Q constantly zero and in some sense some people interpret this q as like a mesh of deviation from the log normal distribution right and again fractional brownian motion takes over because if and again i'm not going to say too much about this but if 
you have a variance which somehow behaves like say a nice function of a fractional Brownian motion. Um, then it turns out that this Q, at least in the asymptotic sense for tau to zero, behaves like tau to the h minus a half. And again, if you want here a tau to the minus a half, that means first of all you can get this, but you have to choose h which is close to zero. Right, and this is the last slide I want to present today. So, uh, uh, and you know, one, I think nice, simple, but actually quite accurate model that does this would be the so-called raffberg ome model. And in the raffberg ome model, you actually, you know, I, I, I ignore the interest rate. I should write the interest rate here as well. I mean, the, 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 the drift here. So you have uh, the variance is an exponential of eta times a fractional Brownian motion, not the classical fractional Brownian motion, but what is often called the Riemann Liouville fractional Brownian motion. Um, so this is not the same process that you see in the Wikipedia if you ask it to what what fractional brown motion is, but it has a lot of similar properties. And uh, yeah, and then you can multiply here with the so called forward variance which allows you to get very fine properties of the implied volatility surface, but the important thing is this term here for us, and then you would actually see this skew explosion. There is many things <laughs> I could say at this point, but time has run out. Oh yeah, maybe one thing that I want to say is another solution could be to include chumps. And of course you can also do both. And there are But I don't like jumps. I'm a continuous person. I <laughs> I'm happy with the uh, Raffberg-Ohme model. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, basically to wrap up, um, is there memory in the financial markets? And the answer is clear: yes. I mean, just think of this uh, Hawks process story. There certainly is memory, and also if you uh, if you look at it from a higher above level, like we did in the second half, there is certainly indication for memory. Of course, in the higher above level, it's more difficult to detect memory because you don't have these clear mechanisms. Okay, look, uh, an order is split into many smaller orders, and high frequency trader come up. You have to do more um, abstract methods like statistical analysis, like looking at autocorrelation functions or stuff like this. Um, and yet, uh, from a very different uh, uh, point of view, we see that uh, we get this kind of fractional models coming up, I think, in a quite natural way if you look at financial data, both from a time series perspective and from an option price perspective. Are there any questions or comments? If not, then thank you very much. And yeah, homework. <laughs> Before the applause, <laughs> homework. I have prepared a, a, a Jupyter notebook. I don't know how we do it. Uh, so circle it to everybody who's interested. Uh, we can, I mean, we know who's registered, so we can circulate uh, via that, that uh, email list if you, if you wish. Yes. That's a possibility. But Perfect. Otherwise, if you have another suggestion, you can do it. Okay, yeah, I will I will send who should I send it to? No, you can send it to, to me and Carlo. Uh, okay. And then we'll Perfect. Go. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you very much. Okay, so this concludes the morning session and uh, we'll reconvene at one thirty. Is that so? Yeah.